Ben Mutchler, the director of the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion at Oregon State University. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the first event ever that Holocaust Memorial Week is sponsoring in Portland. It's been going on at OSU for 29 years now, and uh, it's just a delightful thing to be up here and be able to reach out to the Portland community and bring some of this outstanding programming to you. We hope this is the first of many such events in the future. Um, and it's been made possible by a series of partnerships and co-sponsorships that we've had. We were co-sponsored by the Middleman Jewish Community Center, which has donated this lovely space. And I want to say a special thanks to Bethany West, who's been helping coordinate the entire event. Um, our school, History, Philosophy, and Religion, has been backing this. And I want to say a special thanks to Bob Fecno, who's over by the camera and uh, has done just a tremendous amount of labor on this, both working on the display and the taping um, and advertising and so forth. Bob has really been stellar. I wanted to say a special word of thanks to the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation, um, which has been steadily supporting Holocaust Memorial Week and for this event uh, offered us extra support and has made it possible. So we want to thank them. And then we've had a series of, of uh, organizations here in Portland that have generously offered to partner with us and spread the word in this inaugural event. And I just wanted to thank uh, each of those organizations. Uh, in turn, the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, the Institute for Judaic Studies, and the Oregon Jewish Community Foundation. Thanks so much to, to all of them and to this sort of interconnected community here, um, which was really a revelation for me. I, I, uh, it's been one of the delightful things in organizing this event is to discover just how rich that is and how interconnected it is. So we have a timely topic tonight, religious rights and human rights. We've had religious liberty laws in Indiana and Arkansas, which you may have noticed in the news of, of late, making this especially timely. But more broadly than that, uh, religious rights and human rights and the relation between the two is a theme permeating our global affairs. How has the promotion of religious rights figured into the larger effort to protect and advance human rights? On the one hand, we find many historical and contemporary declarations of rights coupling freedom of thought, belief, conscience, and religion. On the other hand, we also see examples of religious freedoms for some being yoked to religious and other forms of oppression for others. Our distinguished panel will be exploring the historical, philosophical, legal, and experiential dimensions of this complicated question. And this is important for me to say here and underscore, we really welcome your contributions um, in the wake of the panel discussion, we would like this to be a launching pad from which we have a broad community discussion. So be thinking about what you'd like to ask and we have floating mics and Bob and I, between the two of us, will we'll be able to get out to you. Wanted to uh, welcome our five panelists and I'll do this in turn. They'll each have the OSU contingent all the way down to our honored uh, guest tonight. We'll have shorter pieces uh, that they'll um, that they'll bring to you. And I'll introduce each of them in turn, and I'll finish with Paul Copperman, who will then introduce our distinguished speaker tonight. So we begin with Professor Rena Lauer, our fabulous new hire. Uh, we are so pleased to bring her a uh, freshly minted uh, PhD from Harvard University, which she received late last spring and she joined us this fall and has already developed a major following in the school. I noticed students marching from class to class uh, following her. Um, she uh, specializes in medieval and early modern Europe, legal and social history with a special focus on Jewish history and the Mediterranean. Professor Lauer, as I said, received her PhD from Harvard in 2014. She has several articles out or nearly out uh, uh, broadly looking at the Jews of Venetian Crete in the 14th and 15th centuries, and she has a book on the same. This will be the, the, her first major work. Her work reads like a great detective story, putting together little clues and weaving it into a kind of fascinating um, narrative. I was really impressed by this in her job talk, and I'm looking forward to more tonight. 
Um, her research has been supported by a number of awards, including the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture and the Gladys Griebel Illness Foundation. She'll be speaking today about minority religions and their legal rights in the medieval Mediterranean. Professor Lauer. Thomas Hobbes' famous lie in the Leviathan to the Middle Ages, claiming that life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I think we can all agree that the Middle Ages would not be the time we would associate with human rights. One group in particular for whom the Middle Ages often seems like a cruel era was the Jewish community. Are you having trouble hearing me? Is that what's going on? Yes. Is this better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. One community, in particular, for whom the Middle Ages seems like a cruel time period, is the Jewish community. Traditionally, the Jewish Middle Ages have been called a valley of tears, and seem to track a fairly straight line from the massacres of Jews in German lands at the hands of crusaders heading to the Levant in 1096, all the way to the Holocaust. And let's be honest, life for Jews in medieval Christendom was at times quite miserable, whether because of expulsions or massacres or daily disenfranchisement by governments which forbade Jews from owning land or holding public office. This would not be the period we would associate with Jews having religious rights. But alongside these negative, reality, these negative realities, there were positive realities. Jews and Christians formed work partnerships, acted neighborly, sometimes even slept together. Recently, a scholar has shown that even that most hated stereotype of Jews, the moneylender, was not always so hated. One Jewish moneylender who was put on trial had a parade of happy Christian clients come to court to defend him. Not exactly the image of the lead up to the ghetto that we expect. But this too is the Middle Ages, a time of meaningful human interactions. There were also other institutional ways in which the Middle Ages was not one long valley of tears for the Jews. Sometimes, and in some places, especially in the countries close to the Mediterranean, in the high and late Middle Ages, so say 1250 to 1500 or so, even governments, which we tend to think of as facilitating anti-Judaism through laws, could be exceptionally accommodating to Jews. Many Jewish communities were allowed to govern themselves to varying degrees, creating a sort of mini-state within the state. In Spain, the Jewish community government was allowed to fine some of its own criminals. A bit later and further afield, in 16th and 17th century Lithuania, the Jewish community government was even legally empowered to dole out corporate, corporal punishment. But in many places, Jewish communities were not given the right to try and enforce punishments on their members, and instead had to function fully within other legal systems. Nevertheless, often, there was a strange little leap loophole that I'd like to talk to you about for the rest of my spiel. And this is one of the ways that Jews who used a secular legal system were able to protect their religious rights, or right to live according to Jewish law, in a surprising way. The key term I'm going to use today is personal law. Personal law is the premise that a group of individuals, for various reasons, should have legal rights and privileges that are unique to their own group. And these laws allow that group to do things differently or even allow them to do things that are forbidden to others. We actually have personal law in play in the United States, in very limited case, in the very limited cases. Recognized members of the Native American church, for example, are allowed to own and use the narcotic peyote and own the feathers of certain endangered birds, illegal for other Americans, because US law recognizes that these are vital and legitimate parts of their sacred ritual. So, 
personal law often plays out as religious, as religious right. As in the modern US, so it was in some Christian countries in the medieval Mediterranean as regarded Jewish rights. I'm gonna focus on two spots. The crown of Aragon, which is in Eastern Spain, and my favorite island, I'm a little biased, it's where I do my research, Crete. Now part of Greece, Crete was actually part of Venice for almost 500 years, starting in 1204, and it had a sizable Jewish population until that population was wiped out in one day during World War II. In these two places, Aragon and Crete, Jews were allowed to maintain religious rights through personal law when they, wanted, when they went to secular court to fight over marriage problems. If a woman wanted a legal separation, and actually legal separation is a medieval concept, even though we think of it as being very modern, or if a man refused to give his wife the appropriate money after they had divorced, the money that was promised in the ketubah, or, marriage, or Jewish marriage certificate, they would often go not to the Jewish court, but to the secular court, which had a lot more enforcement power. And when they did, the governments of Aragon and Crete, as in some other spots, the government actually promised the Jews that the court would decide marital disputes based on Jewish rabbinic law, or halakha, because of personal law rights. So yes, this means that a Catholic judge in a secular court had to rule on Jewish marriage cases according to halakha, or rabbinic law. So how did they do it? How did judges learn about the Jewish law and religious rights that they had to maintain? In Spain, the answer is quite clear and quite fascinating. Sometimes the judges consulted with leading rabbis of the time and would learn about the intricacies of Jewish law as it concerned a particular case from them. That's one way. A second way was that instead of having a Catholic judge hear the case, the king of Aragon would actually deputize one of those rabbis to act as a judge for the case. So we have the most pious rabbis of Barcelona who in their writings often say, oh, you cannot go to a secular court. We have them on Monday acting as judges of the secular court and then on Tuesday going to act as the judge of the Beit Din or Jewish court. So it's clear that Jewish legal systems and secular legal systems, which medieval rabbis famously claimed were totally separate and could not meet, actually intersected regularly. That's in Spain, where we see experts teaching experts, Jewish rabbinic experts in halacha teaching Catholic experts in secular Spanish law. But what about Crete, Venice's flagship colony? How did the Venetian court there find out about Halakha? Here, on an island where the judges were all well-educated amateurs, none of them had studied law, there were no experts involved. Rather, the Jewish litigants themselves had the power in their hands to shape what the judges knew or thought Halakha meant. So, in 1401, Joseph Massini, a Jewish man on Crete, managed to convince the Venetian court that not only was bigamy allowed for Jews, but that the secular court should allow him to remain married to two wives. Joseph's first wife had actually sued him for legal separation, but Joseph managed to convince the court to convince his wife to forget about the separation and stay married to him, as long as she got her own house away from the second younger wife. And sure enough, the court did. So, a panel of three Catholic judges whose own religion and own state law absolutely forbade bigamy as a religious, moral, and social evil ended up sentencing this couple to remain in a bigamous marriage because they were convinced that Judaism allowed it to. And thus, because of Jewish personal law rights, they couldn't forbid it. Quite a different image than our usual image of how law and courts treated Jews in the Middle Ages. So as I come to my very short time up here, 
Let me stress the fact that life for Jews in medieval Europe was more complicated than just good or bad. Rather, even medieval governments recognized that minority religious groups should have the right to live according to their own laws in some cases. Those religious rights could even be against the laws and morals of the judges themselves. But those judges and those states put aside their own social and religious assumptions to accommodate religious rights. So as we move forward into the modern period with our next few panelists, I want to highlight that we cannot imagine a clear narrative of progress, that everything was bad for minority religious groups before in some amorphous past. And then in the modern period, we discovered human rights, <coughs> but rather that even in the Middle Ages, sophisticated and thoughtful governments sometimes took difference into consideration. Not because people were all the same, as human rights doctrine tends to emphasize, but rather with the conception that some people were different, and that difference gave them real religious rights and privileges. Thank you.